Thank you for choosing the BNMS website. My name is Simon Hughes. I'm a consultant in radiology and nuclear medicine in Birmingham in the UK. This is part of the Applied Anatomy course that I've added to the BNMS YouTube channel. Today we're going to talk about the base of the skull, looking at the CT anatomy of the foramina and the orbit and the inner ear and discussing the cranial nerves that are associated with these structures. The base of the skull is a complex region of anatomy but we'll try and indicate to you a a more systematic approach, looking at the foramina from anterior to posterior. We'll have some review of the cranial nerves and other structures that pass through this foramina. There are 12 cranial nerves. These are from one to 12 listed here, olfactory, optic, oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens, facial, vestibular cochlear, glossopharyngeal, vagus, accessory, hypoglossal. There's a very simple mnemonic to try and remember these if you struggle. Ooh, 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 to touch and feel, very good velvet, our heaven. And there are others available. This is the one I used to use many years ago. These nerves are mixed, sensory, motor, or both. And a, a mnemonic to remember from the first cranial nerve to the twelfth, whether they are sensory, motor, or both, is some say marry money, but my brother says big brains matter more. So some is S, that's the olfactory nerve, and that's sensory. We shall look at where these nerves pass, uh, through which foramina and which base of skull structures we can assume these nerves are. The cranial nerves are numbered 1 to 12, following generally their exit from the base of the brain. And we can see on this uh, cartoon here. Note that the largest nerves are doing the most work, taking the most uh, information. So the thickest are the optic nerve, the trigeminal nerve, the facial nerve, and the vagus. So these are the largest nerves. Also note that the abducens nerve, so that's the sixth cranial nerve, is the only one to exit from the true ventral brain. So that's the nerve uh, appearing uh, between the pons and the medulla pyramidalis. Again, we shall see how these nerves exit through the different foramina within the base of the skull. On this cartoon, we can again see a review of the nerves, 1 to 12, and a rather crude assessment of the function that each nerve uh, is uh, involved in. So the first nerve is olfactory and uh, involved in the sense of smell and that seems uh, uh, very reasonable. And again the second nerve, the optic nerve, of course intimately involved in vision. Oculomotor makes sense, being involved in eyeball movement but also some movement of the eyelids. 
The trigeminal nerve is uh, both motor and sensory. It's involved in muscles of mastication and chewing, uh, but also involved in facial pain and touch and divided into three major divisions. The abducens uh, innervates a single ocular motor uh, rectus muscle, the lateral oblique. The facial nerve again is both motor and sensory involved in the muscles of facial expression but also the production of tears and saliva and involved in taste. Vestibulocochlea, that's the nerve of hearing, but also the vestibular complex and balance. Glossopharyngeal, the ninth cranial nerve, involved in taste and also innervates the carotid bulb. This is a structure within the internal carotid artery outside of the brain involved in the maintenance of blood pressure. The vagus, one of the large nerves that we talked about on the previous slide, is the vagus nerve and this has uh, multiple and extensive extensions into the remainder of the body involving blood pressure maintenance, heart rate, digestive tract and taste. The 11th nerve, the spinal accessory nerve, is motor for the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid and some muscles of swallowing. And the hypoglossal, the 12th nerve, makes sense that this is involved in the motor innovation of tongue movement. So here is the first image of the base of the skull, and this is a coronal uh, CT. Uh, and this is showing the region of the Crista Gali containing the cribriform plate. Sitting on this are the olfactory bulbs. And then the olfactory nerve is going to uh, project posteriorly back into the brain uh, within the anterior cranial fossa. So if you go back to slide four, you will see the olfactory bulbs and the olfactory nerves uh, projecting uh, posteriorly on the inferior surface of the frontal lobes. This is quite a difficult region to see accurately on CT or MRI. These are very thin regions of bone. Uh, but these are uh, where they are. As we go through some of these images and we, as we descend through the whole of the body, I will try and get you to look at and make relationships to other structures. We'll review all of these structures in more detail elsewhere but it'll allow you to start to develop a more 3D appreciation of the interconnectedness of anatomy, which is one of the important things I think to appreciate. So on this coronal image, I'm sure you've already seen, but I want you to be able to recognize the anterior cranial fossa containing the frontal lobes, the roof of the orbit, the orbit containing the posterior globe on both sides and surrounded by the uh, rectus muscles. Inferior to the Christogale, you see multiple air spaces. These are the anterior ethmoids on both sides. You see the right and left nasal cavity inferior to these containing the turbinates and lateral to the nasal cavity you will see the right and left maxillary sinus. And again, we'll review all of these uh, structures in detail elsewhere. Lateral to the 
lateral wall of the maxillary sinus, you'll see uh, some a fat plane uh, containing uh, part of the temporalis, which you can see on the left side, and bordered laterally by the right and left masseter. So this fat plane, this uh, fat region, is the infratemporal fossa. And we'll see that multiple cranial nerves connect to this infratemporal fossa. It's an important highway between the base of the skull, and therefore the brain, and the facial structures. Inferior to the right and left maxillary sinus, within the maxillary bone is the alveolar process of the superior dentures. And we see the right and left body of the mandible. And in between these four structures, we see the tongue. And again, we'll review all of this in head and neck anatomy. You'll see two little triangular bony structures sitting at the base of the tongue. And this is the hyoid bone. And again, we'll review all of these in detail elsewhere. This axial CT is showing the position of the optic canal. This is going to take the second cranial nerve, the optic nerve, as it passes back from the back of the globe itself through the bony orbit and it's going to pass into the intracranial space itself through the optic canal. Of course you've seen before the structures of the diaphragmina cella and the supracellar system when we reviewed the anatomy of the pituitary fossa. And you'll recall that the optic chasma sits on top of the diaphragma cella as it forms the roof. And the supracellar system sits on top of this, and this is where the optic chiasma, the crossing over of the uh, of the fibers from both the right and the left optic nerve. If you click, you'll see the red circle showing the position of the right optic canal. And again, quickly reviewing this image, you can see the anterior ethmoids in axial image. We see both the right and the left orbit with the orbit and some indication of the rectus muscles. We see the lateral wall of the orbit. And we can see part of the posterior clinoids is going to form part of the pituitary fossa structures that we've reviewed before. We're now going to discuss the superior orbital fissure. This is difficult to see on any, any imaging including CT, because it's a slightly irregular structure. It's important because it takes important nerves. The third, fourth ophthalmic division of the trigeminal and the abducens pass through the superior orbital fissure into the orbit itself. You'll remember that these are the important nerves that pass through the wall of the lateral cavernous sinus. And uh, you can review this on the uh, previous uh, recordings on this BNMS YouTube channel. 
Again, uh, if we quickly review some of the adjacent uh, CT structures that we can see, we can now see the, uh, the nasal burns themselves, the anterior and posterior ethmoid sinuses. We can see the orbits much better on this contrast-enhanced CT. And in the uh, left orbit especially, we can see the orbit itself. We can see the lens and the cornea. We can see the optic nerve that we now know is going to pass into the optic canal. And we can see both the medial and lateral rectus. Uh, adjacent or lateral to the lateral wall of the orbit, we can see uh, the soft tissue. This is temporalis muscle. So this is the muscle that's going to descend into the infratemporal fossa that we've discussed. Uh, we can now see uh, uh, posterior to uh, the nasal spaces. Um, we can see the anterior clinoids on both the right and the left side. We can see the pituitary fossa itself and its surrounding bony structures. And then posterior to the superior aspect of the clivus, we can see contrast within the basilar artery as it sits anterior to the pons of the midbrain. And just on the right side, we can see some air within the superior part of the mastoid sinuses. And we can see the superior right and left pinna. Here we're going to discuss the inferior orbital fissure and some related structures. So the inferior orbital fissure, if you click, you'll see two red ovals. And you can see the uh, fissure within the inferior aspect of the bony orbit, as you'd expect. This takes the middle meningeal vein. If you click again, you'll see two yellow arrows. And this will show that the inferior orbital fissure connects to a very important space within the base of the skull called the pterygopalatine fossa. And you'll see this coming up over and over again. Pterygopalatine fossa is important because it's a direct connection with the infratemporal fossa laterally. Can you follow the pterygopalatine fossa laterally into the infratemporal fossa? You can see the temporal muscles within it. So this pterygopalatine fossa, you can now see, connects with the orbit. It connects superiorly with other cranial, uh, with other foramina within the base of the skull. If you click again, you'll see a green arrow, which is the pterygoid canal, and this connects with the right and left carotid canal. So if you click again, you'll see some blue arrows. So now you can see that the pterygopalatine fossa connects superiorly with the, or anteriorly with the orbit, laterally with the spaces, the infratemporal fossa, and therefore the uh, fascial spaces within the face itself, posteriorly with the carotid canal, and superiorly with other cranial foramina. So it's a direct connection between the face and the brain and is important in uh, lots of pathologies. If we run down the left-hand side of the CT image, we can try and see other structures. You can see the nasal bones, you can see the right and left nasal space. You can see the superior aspect of the left maxillary sinus, the dark air space. You can see the right and left sphenoid sinus, medial to the green arrowed pterygopalatine, sorry, pterygo pterygoid canal. 
you can see the right and left zygoma and you can see the air within the external auditory meatus and extending towards the structures of the middle ear that we'll review. You can see the gas within the right and left maxillary sinus and you can see the posterior cranial fossa containing the cerebellum. That's the first part of the uh, review of the anatomy of the base of the skull. Uh, if you want to see the second part, then go back to the BNMS YouTube channel uh, playlist and you can see part two. Um, and I'll look forward to hearing you there. Thank you for choosing the BNMS YouTube channel.